talk about betrayal trauma. And um, I'm going to be using the word, I'm probably going to be talking about pornography sort of generically, but I'm talking about any sort of betrayal trauma that relates to what we would call like intimate betrayal, where what you thought was really going on is now something totally different. And that can be with affairs, that can be with any kind of secret at all. And so if I end up talking about pornography, that's just because I'm used to talking about pornography, but it can be about anything. So I want to introduce you to a woman named um, Martha True Larkin. And uh, she died a number of years ago at the age of 92, but when she was, uh, when she was 30, I believe-ish years old, um, her husband died in a plane accident in the, in the early 1940s and uh, left her with six kids to raise by herself. And a, um, an acquaintance of mine gave me her, her story. And as I read it, it sounded really familiar to what I hear from women every day in my office who are dealing with intimate uh, betrayal. So I want you to hear in her own words what this was like. And she wrote this the day after her husband uh, passed away in this plane accident. She says, a bomb was dropped on my known world. My world was shattered. Not a marker of any kind left to tell me where to go. Everyone was shouting, go this way. I know the way, go that way. They would say, I've been there before. No, you should go this way. No, I'm sure I'm right. She says, but my heart was shattered and it didn't matter. I was 34 years old yesterday, but today I am a thousand. How can time skip like that? I'm so alone in a sea of people. No one really cares about just me. Oh yes, they say they do. And they mean, and they mean it so far as they can go. But I have to go alone and find my own way amongst the landlines. Those helping me decide just hand me a mask that I must wear. No one can bear the agony they see on my face, so I put the mask on. It makes everyone else feel better. I'll wear it until I can live without it. I'm standing on the sidelines watching a production take place, but I have the main part. I hope my mask fits. It's so heavy, and every once in a while I have to take it off for a few minutes. But people can't see, stand to see the real me. It's like walking in a no man's land. How can the sun come up and a new day begin when I can never see it? I hate it. I hate it to be so planned and perfect. It mocks me because I can't see the one normal thing in its former setting. It's also colored with sadness and heartbreak. It can't be normal. The bomb destroyed all of that. I've got to find a way out of this confusion, one that I can live with. Isn't that powerful? Now I'm going to read you a letter from a wife who wrote a sadness letter in my therapy work with her about her husband's betrayal of sexual uh, addiction. Dear so-and-so, I have cried a thousand tears over the years, and each tear that has fallen from my eyes is a piece of my heart. I am sad that you have not seen me cry most of these years, as I felt it was easier to hide my feelings from you. I am sad that it is hard for you to understand my pain and sorrows. I am sad that our marriage has suffered so long with this pornography addiction between us. I see and feel the shame that you have carried around from your pornography actions, and I am sad that this shame has uh, has been the controlling factor of how our marriage has evolved over the past six years. I am sad not to know what we could have. I am sad to not know what we could have been without this at the forefront of our marriage. I am sad that uh, I have lost out on many opportunities with friends and my children because I was preoccupied about things you might be doing or other things you have done. I am sad that I have not been able to reach my full potential as a wife and a mother because your act of addiction has played with my mind, heart, and body. I am sad that you have become a selfish man with you in mind most of the time. I am sad that our cute little children have been subject, uh, have been subject uh, to having pornography in our home and that you would ignore the needs of our children and feed your addiction. I am sad that your heart has been stolen away from you by seductive women on the internet that only care about making the next buck on their sexuality and feeding their own addictions. I don't know what your real heart is like. I want to know who you really are and I want to know what is in your heart and I am sad I can't see God's potential for you. I am hurt that I have been at the brunt of your blame through the years. This has burdened me and has caused me much grief. I am hurt that we don't have a pure sexual relationship. Our sexual relationship has been tainted by your addiction. It causes me grief when I think about wanting to make love to you. My mind first goes 
to, is he thinking about the women he has seen on the internet or me? I am sad that our marriage has not been clean and virtuous in the sight of God over the years. I am sad that this addiction has caused me to question your worthiness in the church leadership position that you've been in. I am sad to have question over our eternal marriage. I am sad that I've had to question some of the advice given by different church leaders that we've had throughout the years because it's been hard for me to trust you. I have lost, at times, complete trust in you as a human, father, and husband, and this makes me the saddest of all because I have felt so lonely. Loneliness brings sadness, and I have been alone without a best friend and without much support for the years. I have felt so burdened because I have felt that I had to hide your addiction, sweep it under a rug, put a front on so no one can know and people can just keep thinking that we are such a cute and in love couple. But it was so sad because I knew the truth. I am sad that you can't see your own destruction you have caused yourself through the years that has woven deep into your heart and mind. I am sad that the memories that first come to mind are the memories that have torn me apart. I regret to say I wonder about other couples I see and wonder if they struggle. I'm sad to be in a judging mind. I'm sad I lost quality time with you. I'm sad that I have to ask you if you had a slip because you feel that sugarcoating things would make me feel better. Tears have come and tears have gone, but the one thing that remains the same is that I carry a burden of sadness around from your addiction. I'm sad to wonder if my heart will be put back together from the grief you have caused me. You see any differences between those two? They sound very similar. To understand betrayal trauma, you have to understand grief and loss. Whether it's the death, a physical death, or an emotional, spiritual death, the body and the, the emotions react the same. In fact, many women tell me that in some ways they secretly, and, and, and feel terrible, if they secretly wish he was actually dead. They feel like in some ways that would have been easier. Because then they don't have to worry about trying to rebuild anything. They just can let that go and worry about it and let God sort it out later or whatever. They just, and these women confess this to me, feeling so guilty that they would wish this because they recognize the task that's ahead of them to heal from this huge hole that's been uh, dropped on them. And so if we see this problem of betrayal trauma in any other frame other than grief and loss, then we will become judgmental, we will become critical, and we will not be helpful to these women. We will not be helpful to them. So if you've never seen this as grief and loss, today's your opportunity to really get in touch with this because, again, like, like Montreux said in her, um, her description of what it's like to live in the aftermath of a death, um, there is really no difference. So this is a, this is a collage of three famous paintings. Um, American Gothic, Scream, and uh, Starry Night. And when we show this to the women we work with in our process, many of them instantly connect with what this feels like to go through betrayal trauma. That there's, a, there's somebody who's emotionless and stoic and acting like everything's fine, while they're feeling all this horror and emotion and rage and fear, while everything around them feels distorted and totally um, unfamiliar. And, and this, this experience of, of, of betrayal trauma is not something that women just feel emotionally. It's something that they feel physically. And they feel um, you know, in a way that, that overrides all of the ways that we feel as humans. Physically, emotionally, spiritually, sexually, relationally. Their thoughts become consumed with it. One woman told me, if it, if it hadn't been for crackers, saltine crackers, and cartoons, my children would not have stayed alive the first two or three weeks after discovery. I was, I was in such a zombie state. I couldn't reach out to help from other people. My husband you know, was in his stuff, and I just had to wake up every day and care for these little people. And, and so there's a physical shutdown, and there's, a, there's an emotional shutdown that happens. And, and so it's, it's not uncommon for, for a woman to feel a, a huge mixture of this. And most of the men that, um, that have betrayed their wives, you know, they, they see this and they experience it in such a visceral way that they don't really know how to respond. So most of them just freeze. And one woman pointed out to me when I showed this to her, she says, I feel like that pitchfork is what my husband uses to keep me away from him. Um, when I'm acting crazy, he's like poking me and saying, you know, something's wrong with you. And so that was her experience, and I thought that was an interesting um, commentary on this. 
I'm going to show you a video so that we can all get into the headspace of a betrayed woman. So this might be uh, triggering to you if you're afraid of heights, but hopefully it won't be triggering to you in any other way. But, but, it, but I want you to understand what it's like and how confusing it is to be a partner who's been intimately betrayed. This is an actual uh, video that happened. These are not actors. And um, this was something that went viral on the internet. Some of you may have seen it. Uh, because of uh, because of the context, you'll see it in just a second. No other females jumped from here, have they? No. I mean, you know it's going to be scary, but you know you're going to be okay, and that's all that matters. Is that you will be okay. <laughs> you know, most girlfriends don't have to have this talk with their boyfriends. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's all you, honey. Don't leave yet. Okay. Uh, okay. You don't have to jump if you don't want to. I don't know if I want to. But you know, this will be the coolest single experience of your life. I know, this is also the scariest thing I've ever done. Yeah. All right, here we go! Oh no, Devin! Not yet! Not yet! Hold on. Oh, you have to respect the countdown. Five! I'm not gonna jump. I don't know if I can jump. I'll count down to zero. If you choose not to jump, I'm totally fine with you not this. jumping. Five! Four! Three! Two! One! Zero! Come on, Reddy, you can! You can! You are so hardcore! You are so hardcore! Four, three, two, one, zero! I can do this. Kenny, I don't think I can do it. Three, two, one, zero! I can't do it. Two, one, zero! You can, you can, you can, you can! Two, one, zero! Maybe somebody else could just go. Two, one, zero! I can't do it. Two, one, zero! I don't even want to jump. Two, one, zero! I don't want to do it. Three, two, one. Zero. I don't want to do it. Put the other hand on the rope. No, I don't. Take six inch step to the right. Just start right there on the edge. Just like that. Honey, I don't want to do it. Put the two hands on the rope. You know I love you, right? No, please don't push me off. Please I'm don't. Right. I am not. I'm right here. I'm right here. I'm not going to push you. I'm not going to push you. But if you stand here for more than ten more seconds, I will. <laughs> <laughs> What'd you say? <laughs> I just got dumped. <laughs> Was it worth it? <laughs> it will be worth it. Someday she'll thank me. Are we doing? <laughs> Anybody ever seen that before? Yeah. You have. Um, what was that like for you to watch that? Curious. Yeah. You feel it in your body, don't you? Yeah. I'm, I'm afraid of heights, and so I struggle with that because I don't like heights. But I think I struggle with it more because of, of what that interaction is like and then his reaction afterwards. Other reactions at all? Yeah? So she said, I think it's going to take a long time for her to trust him. What actually happened was a week later, she actually broke up with him. And then she went on the news because this had gone viral. And she said in front of the news camera that it had nothing to do with this. And maybe consciously in her mind it didn't. But I can't imagine how somebody like that could ever feel safe in a relationship where that not only happened, but then he put it on the internet so he can make himself more famous at her expense. And so I'm glad she broke up with him. I don't know him, he's probably a really nice person, but in that moment, it certainly wasn't one of his best boyfriend moments. And um, this, is what, this is what a double message feels like. This is what intimate betrayal feels like. It's, I'm having one experience with you and you're telling me in one year, I'm not gonna push you, I'm not gonna push you. You don't have to jump. You don't have to do this. Like, you're fine, you're safe. He's, he's soft, he's sweet, he's like holding on to her and then he shoves her off the edge. 
And he has this illusion of control. I've rigged up the rope, she's gonna be safe. He doesn't know what her limits are. He can't decide that for her. And so intimate betrayal is when what you think is happening all of a sudden changes at the, at the hand of someone that was supposed to protect you. It would, I don't think anybody, any, any one of us in here would say that this, this man had her back. He did not have her back. And she, and she uh, I think at a very deep biological level, would have a reflex inside of her that would flinch every time he says, trust me, like, I'll take care of you, you're fine. And I, and I just don't think that that would be something that she'd ever be able to trust. A double message can come as something as simple as what we would call emotional dishonesty, and we all do this every day. You know, when somebody asks how we're doing, we tell them we're fine, and we're not fine. Now, to a perfect stranger at the grocery store or whatever, um, it's probably not a big deal. I don't know that any of us practice that kind of radical honesty. <laughs> where, where we just tell everybody exactly how we feel all the time. Uh, maybe you do, and good for you, but most of us just, just go with kind of the game. And that's a form of double message, where maybe somebody does pick up on something that's weird. Maybe somebody who's a little closer to us and knows our energy, and then they say to us, you know, how are you doing, Jeff? And I say, I'm okay. You know, but they can tell I'm not okay. That's one level of double message, all the way to living a double life, where... Um, all of your actions and behaviors are incongruent between what you say and what you do. And both of those, whatever, wherever you are in the continuum, that's all really very uh, betraying to an intimate bond. Um, as a matter of fact, most of the couples I, I work with start out with an initial disclosure where they go from um, just telling the, what we would call just behaviors, this is my story, these are the things I've done, this is, this is the life that I hid from you. But long term in the recovery process, the kind of stuff they're working on a year, two years into the process are eliminating all double messages. All double messages. So that there is no intimate betrayal anywhere. So one example, a, uh, a gentleman was uh, driving back from a work meeting that had gotten out early and he and some of his coworkers went and grabbed some uh, dessert afterwards. And he was still driving home at the exact same time he had told his wife he would be coming home. Because he watched the time and was being responsible. So he's driving home and his, his wife, he called his wife to check in and say, hey, just coming home. And she says, well, did you guys just leave the meeting? He's all, yeah, just left. And then she later found out that they'd gone to dessert. And for her, that mismatch, and this couple had been doing really good recovery work, They'd been in recovery for a couple of years. He hadn't had any relapses or slips with pornography or acting out. But that was betrayal trauma for her. Because why wouldn't he just tell her that they had gone to get dessert? Why would he not account for 30 or 40 minutes of his time? Why would he hide that from her? And that sets in motion all kinds of questions. And so working on long-term Healing betrayal trauma is really about making everything match all the time. It's just simple honesty. Um, but this is how sensitive a betrayed person is to the truth and to, and to untruths. It, there's, there has to be a, a match every time. This is an old Russian proverb that I ran across. It's better to be slapped with the truth than kissed with a lie. Um, my experience has been that what is the most damaging with betrayal trauma isn't so much the acting out behaviors, as traumatic and awful as those are and can be, but it's the fact that they were hidden. If, if because it doesn't really give the person who's betrayed a chance to choose in or out. If, if you're dating someone and right out the gate they say, you know what, uh, I struggle with pornography and I'm not really in a good recovery process yet, uh, but I still like you and want to form a relationship with you so we can be together someday. Chances are most women that are in that situation would either slow things way down and create tons of space for a good recovery process to take hold, or they would end it. But when they go into a relationship where none of that's known, then what ends up happening is um, they're making decisions about their future and day-to-day -day interactions based on a total lie. 
And so a lot of women will tell me things like, you know, I get that the acting out behavior only took minutes, but keeping the secret was 100% of the time. And so every single thing that we did, every Disneyland vacation, every time that we said a prayer together as a couple, every time that he told me he loved me, that was coated with a lie that he was holding. And so I feel like my whole relationship has now been a lie. And this is confusing for a lot of men because they feel like, well, I, I'm still the same guy. I just made some mistakes and didn't tell you. But once you make that mistake and, and it goes underground and goes inside, you've now activated the lie. And once the lie is on, everything is filtered through the lie now. And so you still may be a really nice guy, and all of that still may be true, but she has to come to a conclusion on her own of matching everything back up and saying, you know, is that true? I worked with a woman who had made a collage. Um, she had a lot of trauma. Her collage was nine feet by six feet. Um, we had to get into the big conference room to lay it all out. And she had taken all the pictures out of the photo album, and I don't encourage this because she regrets it now, but she had taken a red Sharpie and drawn an A on his forehead, and all the pictures from the time frame of his acting out behaviors. She goes, I can't trust that he was like caring about our family here or here or here. And there were so many, it was very sad to see. But that, that really showed me how coded the whole history uh, becomes. One commentator, um, I don't know if I have that quote in here or not. Um, there's a really great article you can Google um, it's, I, I, didn't, I didn't bring the reference with me here, but, but um, I think it's Anna Fell is her name. But, she, but the article is called Great Betrayals, and it's from the New York Times. So if you just Google Great Betrayals in the New York Times, you'll read it. She's a, she's a uh, I, don't, I think she's a psychiatrist, but she writes about betrayal in a way that to me is very descriptive. And she uses an analogy. She says it's a lot like your computer being infected with a virus that your whole history now has been infected with this virus. And you know, in, in the case of a computer, it's hard to go through and guess which file has been corrupted. You don't really know. So the solution is usually just to wipe out the whole thing and start over. And so repairing betrayal trauma for a partner, they can't just wipe it all out and start over. So that's why it takes so long to go back through and figure out the whole story and what's real and what's not real. These are some slides that I, um, that I was uh, uh, allowed to use from one of my colleagues, uh, Jeff Ford, who, who designed a few of these here. And, uh, I think they're very descriptive, and, and, and I think it's pretty self-explanatory. But the wife, this is part of the double message, what she experiences is this shiny person that seems to be doing fine, but her body is sensing someone who is broken down under the power of an addiction or some sort of secret. You know, that inside he's really feeling shame and darkness and not, you know, very good about himself. But what she's experiencing is this other, this other person, and so it's very confusing. And many women that I work with know about the addiction long before they can articulate anything about the addiction. And so, so she's, so she's sensing this, she's seeing that, it's extremely confusing. And so what she ends up with is it, it kind of puts her into a mode of uh, trying to compensate or, or figure out exactly um, how she's going to stabilize this because it all feels so uncertain. So I'm going to read you another. This is actually from the same woman that wrote the previous sadness letter that I read you. So she told me when she started to sense this disconnect, these double messages, she started to feel on the one hand that he was um, you know, a good guy, but something was odd or whatever. I remember uh, last night I was talking to Real Croshaw. She said it was always so odd. You know, I would come home and Stephen just always seemed so tired all the time. And I used to just think, oh, he just works hard and he's just a really, you know, really busy person. But it was really this other sense of like, something just seems kind of low and, and tired. So when that happens, a partner who's tuned in is going to try and fix it or adjust it. So this is what she said. She said, I took on many different roles, such as the fix-it wife. I really thought I could fix him, so I tried everything for him so he could have more time for himself, so he would not be stressed out. I'd make sure everything was perfect as I could get it. 
That didn't really work. So then I took on the role of the threatened wife. I would threaten him with different things if he looked, such as no sex, no hanging out with friends, no going on trips with guys. I threatened to sell the motorcycles, which were his life, besides me. I took, that didn't really work, so then I took on the role of the angry wife. I would yell at him, I wouldn't talk to him, I slapped him in the face a couple times. And then, that didn't really work, so then I tried the not caring wife. I tried not to care when he told me that he looked again, and I didn't want him to see that, that I was hurt. And then I eventually took on the role of the obsessed wife. I would call him during the day and check on him. And that got to the point of me checking on him a few times a day because I didn't feel like I could trust him. Then I took on the role of the spiritual wife. I made sure that he was making appointments with his church leader after he messed up. Or I made sure prayers and scriptures were done for him, that we were doing that all the time. I prayed for him all the time. I got to the point where I was getting so exhausted, I didn't know what else I could do. I was running out of roles. And these roles were making our relationship more toxic. So, a lot of the times, when we're trying to help somebody who's dealing with betrayal trauma, we'll oftentimes assign them a role. Well, why don't you try this? Why don't you try doing this or do more of this? And most, most of the women I've worked with are gladly looking for anything that feels concrete, that feels like a solution. So they just they jump right into it with, you know, with a lot of gusto and they just want to make it work and fix it because that attachment is so important to them. But we don't really help partners who are experiencing betrayal trauma by giving them more roles to take on. And we'll talk about really how to help them and where to start with that. So because there's that wall between him and her and she's trying to manage all this and figure it out, there's another dynamic that starts to happen which, uh, which you know, we'll just call the switcheroo. And the switcheroo really is about him discharging the pain of the addiction and all the shame and all of the self-loathing, discharging it back onto her. And it's almost like, you know, if each person had their own plate, you know, where his plate is full of, his plate is, you know, full of shame and there's the betrayal and the addiction, there's just all these, um, these elements on his plate. Her plate, of course, is just her life, relational stuff, you know, just all the different stressors of living and running a home. But what happens with the switcheroo is, is really that he clears his plate and puts it right onto her plate. Um, and and this, is, this is a form of betrayal trauma. And this isn't just about having secret behaviors and acting out. This is about refusing to carry their, his own recovery and do his own work. This is about him being able to say, this is super heavy and uncomfortable, and I don't really know what to do with it. So I'm just going to make it your problem. You're being unreasonable. You're expecting too much. I'll never be good enough for you. Um, it's just, just a lot of blame and shoving everything back onto her. And a lot of the times, there's, uh, she, he'll get a lot of help from other people to do that. Sometimes his family members will think that she's being unreasonable, or a church leader will look at this and say, look, he's such a nice guy. And then everybody's just shoving everything onto her plate. And, um, there are, there, unfortunately, there are lots of people that are just really thrilled to help clear his plate and, and to help him feel better. And she ends up carrying the whole load, which, again, is abandonment. To me, it's abusive. It's a form of trauma. And, you know, I don't really know that many, like, men that I've worked with that I think are, you know, sociopaths and, and are doing this maliciously. But honestly, I'm not even really worried about their intentions. What I'm worried about is the fact that it even happens. And so for a man to really help his wife heal from betrayal trauma, or anybody else who's trying to help her, one of the best things you can do is help him identify what's on his plate and keep it there. And maybe even help him pay attention to what's on her plate and maybe help clear some of that off of her plate so that he can help her be able to function a little bit better. And when that switcheroo happens, when he's clearing everything off, it creates more confusion and more trauma for her. So there's, it's almost like the aftershock, it's like the trauma after the trauma. If the initial trauma is discovery of this addiction of this secret life, the secondary aftershock is the trauma of basically being alone with it all. Most of the men that I've worked with, after they tell their story or get caught, they feel an initial sense of relief, they feel a sense of Oh, finally, I'm not 
the only one that's gonna carry this secret around. This, is, this has been so heavy for me and I feel free, and it's embarrassing, but at least I'm not stuck with the secret anymore. But then all of a sudden her process begins of having to like sort all this out again, this virus and figure it all out. And so it's really easy for everybody to rally around um, around him, he gets to create a new story, he gets to be the, the new, we all love to help the underdog and the person who's going to change, and it's really easy to rally around him, but not recognize that she's now having to start writing a whole new story as well, and to figure out what that's like. And so, for those of us who are working to help those who are experiencing betrayal and trauma, um, if we, if we can help her, um, feel validated and recognize that this is a brand new beginning for her and that she's starting her process while he's sort of in the middle of his. Ten more minutes? Okay, thanks. Then, um, then I think we'll do a lot more uh, for them than just assuming that, well, now that he's out and everything's better, we're finally going to get somewhere and this is all going to be wonderful. Um, I think it's shocking to a lot of people how in a lot of cases that's the very beginning one of the challenges that of having her plate um, when she gets the switcheroo is it can, it can trigger a lot of what we would call mismanagement of her own pain. And this is where women who are dealing with betrayal trauma have to take their own accountability for the way they respond. I love the way that Stephen and Real shared in the last uh, session where they said that it's not his fault necessarily that he was exposed to pornography or had formed an addiction. Most men, a lot of them, you know, it's, it's on board long before they can consciously even choose to have an addiction. It's just something that is, uh, is more developmental for many of them. They may, not be, they may be powerless against the addiction, but they can choose recovery, and they're responsible for choosing recovery. And I would say the same thing to any woman who's doing betrayal trauma. She may be powerless against the fact that this was just dumped on her, but she does have a responsibility to take care of herself regardless of what she chooses and does because her own health and her own life is worth taking care of. So a lot of women will end up getting into their own addictions. Um, it can be with uh, food. Uh, some of the more common ones I see with women in particular are around food, around anger, around um, you know, mismanaging their time, money, cleaning, stuff like that. Stuff that's just more in their environment if they're traditionally caring for a family. Um, it can be an overfocus or distraction in other areas. It can be this kind of quiet desperation, just shutting down and going inside. That's all mismanagement pain. And women suffer tremendously when they do that. And so it's not helpful, it's not helpful to excuse unhealthy behavior in partners who have been betrayed. It doesn't help them at all. We don't have to hold them accountable in the sense of, you know, like they're doing something like morally wrong or something. You know, we don't have to shame them but we can invite them to really slow down and look at how they're feeling and how their life is being affected by this. Um, we want them to be as healthy as, as possible at the same time validating where that comes from. Um, a lot of the men who struggle with the addiction will mismanage their pain as well. Um, and so there'll be a lot of defensiveness and you know, intellectualizing, withdrawing, stuff like that. And so I'm not really going to spend a lot of time on what the men do in here. But what ends up happening is if she's mismanaging her pain and she's not really taking good care of herself. And she's just going to um, isolate and hide and not be real about what's happening. In a lot of ways, then you have two people who are basically faking each other out and creates a huge fracture in the relationship and they don't go anywhere. And so regardless of whether he takes down his wall, a betrayed partner has to take down her wall and get honest and real about how this is affecting her. I loved how Will said that the first three years, she didn't think that she had anything to work on. And as long as he got better, she would be fine. And so we want to invite partners to understand and explore what's behind that wall and like what's affecting them. How do they feel? Like what's going on? How are they coping? And when we can give them that help, they just do so much better. We have to start with accountability for the men. The men can lead out with this. If we have men who are willing, who have betrayed their wives, and they're, they're willing to, to do a full disclosure, to be totally honest about what they've done, and, and acknowledge it without any kind of blame, and take full responsibility for it, that sets conditions in the relationship 
where the relationship can heal faster. If her battle is constantly trying to get the truth, if her battle is constantly trying to get into reality, if she's fighting him for that, then it will put off their ability to heal as a couple. And then she may have to decide, if I'm going to heal, then I've got to either choose us or me. And if you're a man that's betrayed your wife, you don't want her to have to make that choice. You want to set up conditions where both can happen. Where the relationship has a space to heal because they're in reality, and she has space to also heal. Um, I've worked with plenty of women who have had to make that difficult choice and have had to say, I've got to save myself, and I can't worry about us anymore. And it's not, it's not that whole thing of she can fix the relationship. It's saying that I don't even know if we even have a relationship to work on. And so I can't worry even about whether I'm going to stay in this or not. I've just got to focus on my own recovery. And that's tragic. And that, that can be changed through just accountability. So men that are honest and, read and real about that and can lead with that accountability, the word I want you to remember is conditions. It creates conditions. And that is, and uh, what she does in those conditions or what they do as a couple in those conditions will vary in how long it takes. But the conditions um, are his primary responsibility. A lot of men wonder, well, what can I do to help rebuild trust? I mean, if I go climb a mountain and declare my love and my safety and trust, and it's, and it's really about, on a daily basis, working really hard to create an environment emotionally, relationally, that says there is room for you to take your time and heal, and I'm going to continue to do my recovery work, but I'm making a space for us as a couple, a container. So we could just call that holding her pain. The picture I put up there earlier of the tortoise and the hare, and going at the pace of the tortoise, that pretty much says it all. Jonathan Sandberg um, wrote a great, uh, gave a great uh, lecture um, at uh, Brigham Young University, and he said that cure and healing are not the same. Healing is not cure because cure is clean, quick, and done, often under anesthesia. Healing, however, is a lifelong process of recovery and growth in spite of, maybe because of, enduring physical, emotional, and spiritual assault. Healing requires time. Healing needs work and time and energy. Cure is passive because you just submit yourself to the practitioner. Healing is active. It requires all the energy of your entire being. You have to be there, fully awake, aware, and participating when it happens. So I want to end with just responding to partners that are dealing with betrayal trauma. And um, this applies to anybody who's trying to help a partner, whether you're the, whether you're the, the, the offender or whether you are a family member, a friend, a church leader, a loved one. The first thing I would say is emotional first aid. And I define that by basically letting her um, have emotional validation, letting her know she's not crazy, Letting her share and express and feel without editing or you know talking her out of it or trying to give a bunch of advice. Emotional first aid again is a lot of what I was talking about in my other presentation. It's about presence. It's about saying I'm making room for you. I'm here with you. You're not alone in this. Um, I don't know what to say, but I'm just here with you, loving you, and that's enough. That's emotional first aid, and we have to be first responders with them. Um, it's rare to have people in our lives that are going to just let it be about what we're feeling in the moment and try to like change it because they're so anxious they can't hold it. So if you're going to be an emotional first aid responder, you've got to be able to sit with a lot of discomfort and even hear things that you might disagree with or make you afraid. But um, that's a critical role to share. Physical care. Um, a lot of women that I've worked with who are dealing with betrayal trauma, this is where they have to get really good at saying no to some things and saying yes to others when it comes to their body. So they might say yes to more naps. They might say uh, no to dishes and just go buy a bunch of paper plates. They might just kind of do anything they can to just decrease the physical stress on their body, whatever their duties and obligations are. They're, 
it's anything that will help them rejuvenate their body and pay attention to, their, to what their body's telling them. Again, the grief and loss um, is more of just a mindset that we have to have as helpers to validate this as a loss that, that often feels worse than death. And in the same way that when someone passes away physically, we don't rush people to get over it and, and try and just get them to forget it. We recognize that there will be a, a long process of letting go and, and integrating this. Grief and loss is not about getting over something. It's about integrating it. It's about weaving it back into your story. It's about learning how to move on in life with this new information and this new reality. And partners that have done good betrayal trauma work, they can look back and talk about the losses and, and stuff without getting paralyzed or overwhelmed by it. But it's very much a part of their story. As you hear, for example, Real talk about her story, she's not up there hyperventilating like she was in the early days because she's integrated it. But she talks about it, and that's, that's the goal, is to be able to see it as a grief and a loss that you honor over time. Um, if you're going to be working with a partner, then you absolutely have to be able to distinguish between forgiveness and trust. Forgiveness is basically releasing the person to God. Trust is about rebuilding a relationship. Trust takes a long time. Forgiveness can happen as soon as they're ready to release that person to God. Trust takes way longer. And if you're trying to rush them in the name of forgiveness, using kind of spiritual pressure, not helpful. Give them space to trust. That takes time and that's earned by the betrayer. Trust is earned back. Forgiveness is something that the, that the wounded just have to, have to work through on their own so that they don't suffer as much. Finally, um, if you're going to listen, you need to be a friend of the marriage. Remember, the person that betrayed them is both a source of pain and a source of comfort. If you jump on the source of pain bandwagon and try and create loyalty, they will stop talking to you because... There's a part of them that isn't sure what they feel about this person because there are two things to them. Stay neutral, stay a friend of the marriage. Make space for the fact that this person has good qualities and harmful qualities. And just stay present with that. And if you start taking sides out of your own anxiety, you will become immediately unhelpful to them. Especially because if they start moving toward the relationship, they'll feel guilty that they can't talk to you because now they're going to be betraying you. Don't make this about you. Make it about the fact that this is a wounded relationship and you're just there. Women who are betrayed need permission to listen to their bodies and their emotions, and we want to make, make it easy for them uh, to be able to navigate this world with our support. So, in conclusion, betrayal trauma, as you can see, is, um, is a physical, emotional, spiritual type of experience. And our job as helpers is to create conditions around them where all of those needs can be met with plenty of validation, plenty of presence, and support and love. And women who are surrounded by that kind of support find their way out of it eventually, where they can integrate this into their story. And we want, we want to be along with them for the whole time, and not just um, in the flurry of the beginning, or wait until after everything's fine. You, we can stay with them and walk with them all the way through. And uh, I know that they'll, uh, they'll appreciate it greatly. So I wish we had time for questions, but that's all the time I've got. Thank you.